Welcome to Silicon Bytes, a brand new format on the Silicon Curtain channel. This video is an experiment. It's the first of a new format. And I'd love to know from the audience whether you think it works, whether you think it'd be improved, whether you want to see more of them. And it'd be great to learn how people can get involved as well. So what we're going to cover on this, things like the latest news, we're going to unpack the headlines, what's significant, cut through all the noise. We're going to look at what the news from Clown World is like, looking at Russian propaganda, what the latest threats and messages are. We're also going to potentially get some guests, especially those who have written articles, which we can unpack and explore. And we're going to take a deep dive in each episode into some form of content. It might be video, it might be an article that's been produced, it might be some in-depth piece of content published uh, in the mainstream media. And of course, we're open to suggestions. We're also going to look at the meme war. So we're going to have a meme of the day, look at what's going on on social media, the messages trending on Twitter and so on in relation to the war and support for Ukraine. And we're going to try and wrap this up into a concise 10 to 15 minute format so it's easy to watch uh, not like the marathon interviews that we have on the site uh, which tend to be uh, an hour or so in length let's get straight into it so what are some of the most significant headlines today so one of the big ones of course is the us has labeled russia's wagner group as a transnational criminal organization that is significant because it puts Wagner's sources of funding at risk, it puts its operations and logistics at risk, and of course anyone associated with its actions around the world is now at risk of arrest and having their resources confiscated. So that's a pretty significant move, um, and we need to see whether that weakens Prigozhin's position. And there's been other key developments in Russia's slide towards full autocracy. The final nail in the coffin is what activists are labeling the closure of the Moscow Helsinki group. For those who don't know, this organization is one of the oldest human rights groups in Russia, founded in 1976 by physicist Yuri Orlov. And it's significant that every vestige of civil society and dissent from the regime is now being closed down and hounded out of the country. And very much linked with that is also the news that Russia has slapped the independent media outlet Medusa with the label as undesirable. Now, Medusa was already considered a foreign agent, therefore not able to run its activities on the territory of Russia. All its materials had to carry the ridiculous label, uh, the foreign agent label, which any media outlet that really reports on the truth needs to put uh, against its materials. But this is one step up. This means that where it can, Moscow will now pursue anybody involved in Medusa, whether that's journalists, whether that's people funding it, um, hosting their offices, uh, or in any way involved in that organization. So that really is a sort of step change in trying to persecute independent media and independent voices. Another piece of news this week, Russia says it's ramping up ammunition production for the Ukraine war. Um, that announcement is accompanied by the usual fluff and lack of detail. But I think it's important to note this announcement comes straight off the back of the US making a similar announcement that is dramatically increasing production of ammunition, uh, gearing up for Ukrainian victory, as opposed to just supporting it in a defensive operation. And this really highlights a lot of the functioning of Russian propaganda. Uh, and its news output. It's reactionary. It sees what America and the Allies are doing, and then it simply tries to project onto that with threats, uh, with stories that sort of mirror uh, what the Allies are doing. Uh, it betrays a deep lack, I think, of strategic planning and thinking, and also indicates that Putin's campaign lacks purpose, I think. Uh, in, in Ukraine. It lacks a clear set of objectives. Also in the news, Lavrov, the most famous human with the horse's head, has been to Africa. And I think this really shows the limits of Russian soft power. I mean, it is grotesque to see Lavrov being greeted by smiles, uh, taken seriously as a leader on the world stage. The lack of concrete agreements uh, the lack of any tangible benefits to Russia from that meeting, I think, underlie the limits 
to Russia's soft power. And as I mentioned earlier, there has been a distinct lack of nuclear threats for a couple of weeks now, but that has not gone away entirely with the news that Orban of Hungary is potentially set to veto EU sanctions on Russia's nuclear energy. Now, this is an absolutely significant uh, story, uh, and it highlights the limits of Western sanctions, the fact that we haven't gone far enough. And I was listening to a fantastic Ukrainian commentator yesterday talking about the fact that Rosatom has not been fully sanctioned by the West. That is something that needs to happen ASAP, removing the credibility uh, of Rosatom, removing removing Russia's tech sector and its representatives from international organizations, from the governing bodies of things like the nuclear industry that help to set standards. Russia needs to be stripped of all credibility on the international stage in order to complete out sanctions and do everything that we possibly can to support Ukraine. Also kicked off this week, Training, training on MARDA infantry fighting vehicles and training on the Challenger tanks in the UK. It looks like this training is going to be fast-tracked uh, to get Ukrainian troops up to speed, potentially either for the spring offensive uh, that's been speculated about or to defend against the rumours of Russian spring offensives as well. Of course, we know that conscription never really stopped in Russia. We also hear rumours that hundreds of thousands of new Morbiki are going to be conscripted into the Russian army, whether that happens fully publicly or whether they just grab people off the streets. It's not clear how that is going to unfold. But certainly as the weather starts to unfreeze in late spring, Ukraine needs to gear up potentially for renewed Russian offensives. And finally, in an entirely predictable move, Russia filed a missile barrage at Ukraine uh, after the announcement of the Leopard tanks. Kiev's army says that out of the 55 Russian missiles fired, 47 were downed by the missile defense systems. That's an extraordinary achievement. Nonetheless, the eight that got through did manage to cause a uh, significant loss of life and damage. And that, of course, is to be hugely regretted. And, and of course, when we're reviewing the news, it has to be remembered that every day Ukrainians are suffering and dying in a war that they did not seek and a war they did not initiate. So this is a video where I'm going to take a deep dive into one of the analytical articles of the week. Um, and this is an especially interesting one because it was published on January the 23rd. Uh, so that is just four days ago. And yet, I would say it's not completely out of date. We'll unpack some of the detail, but certainly the headline is, is, uh, is, is out of date here. And it's been superseded by the incredible news of tanks being delivered to Ukraine. So this article is from the Centre for European Policy Analysis. It was published on January the 23rd of this year, and it's by Stephen Blank. It's entitled Germany to Crocodile, Eat Me Last. And this is very much taken from the Churchill uh, analogy um, that if you feed the crocodile, and this is basically uh, his analogy for what appeasement does, if you feed the crocodile, eventually you will run out of victims to feed that or run out of food supply and the crocodile will turn to you and eat you last. And until a couple of days ago, this very much seemed to be the German approach to Russia. Appeasement is a strong word, but certainly that streak of pacifism, that uh, series of endless delays and prevarication on providing armaments to Ukraine um, seems much more to be in the vein of uh, a strategy to not let Ukraine lose rather than letting it win decisively. But there seems to be a trigger point this week. But there's some detail in the article that we really should unpack because I think it's very easy the world to fall back into that mindset of appeasing Russian 
terror and Russian threat. Uh, they've been quite quiet on the nuclear front uh, in the last couple of weeks. But as soon as Russia is backed into a corner again, those nuclear threats are likely to make a resurgence. At the Ramstein meeting, it did seem that Europe could not agree on a common approach to uh, to Russia. It now seems that perhaps pressure was applied after that Ramstein meeting on January the 20th, or else Germany did, perhaps didn't want to make that announcement in such a sort of public sphere as the Ramstein conference. Nonetheless, it broke up without a significant commitment to providing heavy armor to Ukraine, only for a couple of days later for Germany to concede that it actually would, and to unblock the export bans, which will allow other European states to deliver that heavy armour, um, states that have been you know, chomping at the bit for some time, like Poland, uh, to increase the support for Ukraine. So the point Stephen here makes is that Europe remains a series of quarrelling competitive states that cannot arise at a consensus regarding Russian security threats or decide on common means to counter them. So it seems the failure to meet the consensus at the conference itself has now been overcome, and there is a degree of alignment on providing heavy armor to Ukraine. But that's just one step in the argument. In mid-February, there's going to be the next Ramstein conference, and that is likely to turn to the next tranche of uh, weaponry that Ukrainians succeed, and that, of course, is fighter jets um, that are essential to complete that combined arms approach, something that in recent interviews Sir Richard Sheriff has spoken extremely eloquently uh, about, and you'll also see on the channel interviews with General Ben Hodges, where this is uh, all men also mentioned in some detail. So too many European states, uh, says Stephen Blank, still want to be Switzerland and take a holiday from history, particularly on defence and security issues. Now, this, I think, still remains an incredibly important point, because we've seen over the last years that the military capability, the offensive capability of many NATO countries has been declining, not increasing. And the state of the German army is not what it was, say, in the 90s and the height of the Cold War. Um, we are going to be getting speakers on the channel who will talk to that point in more detail. Uh, but I think that's a key point to remember. Just because armament is being provided now, that does not immediately mean that NATO's capability is up to uh, full defensive strength. Publicly, Germany argued that it would only send the Leopards if America sent the M1 Abrams as well. And this is despite the symbolic gesture of the UK uh, making the first move and sending challenges. That didn't seem to be enough for Germany. They wanted America to have that skin of the game, which logistically uh, is a challenge. But Biden, you know, to give him his due, uh, realized that that blocker needed to be overcome. So why is it that Germany has been so reluctant to provide this armament? Well, there's lots of reasons. And if we're being charitable, then certainly that ingrained pacifism that followed the Second World War is quite an understandable emotion. The idea of German tanks killing Russians uh, with uh, German symbols, potentially uh, graphic on the side of those vehicles, that is perhaps too much for many Germans to take, given the unhappy history. But you can also make a case that that is to abdicate responsibility from history and historic actions. Nazi Germany murdered millions of Poles, Ukrainians, Bolts, Russians, Jews, and these have all been lumped into a single category. And much of that guilt is being projected onto Russia. And that really isn't fair to the victims. That is an evasion of moral responsibility rather than an acceptance of it is something that Stephen Blank makes really clear in his article. Let's also unpack this idea that Germany, despite not until now making uh, those contributions of heavy armor, has nonetheless uh, taken some pretty significant steps in response to Russia's war of aggression. So they would make the case that they've reduced the energy dependence uh, on Russia in extraordinary time. They have helped to defuse the terroristic threat, the energy weapon that uh, Putin was holding over Europe, seeking to use um, 
energy costs, lack of gas as a way of blackmailing Europe and uh, the European economy. That has ostensibly not worked in the way he anticipated. But we also have to remember, and Stephen makes a very strong case here, that Germany has not always acted uh, in concert with its allies. It has not always acted in its own strategic military interests. And the saga of the Nord Stream pipelines one and two really have revealed that in the past, over several decades, Germany has been determined to push the interests, its own interests, at the expense, uh, its own economic interests, at the expense of uh, its allies' uh, defence and their protestations that dramatically increasing dependence on Russian hydrocarbons uh, is, uh, is an incredibly risky step to take. Uh, of course, it has to be said, you can also make the case that the City of London and many other institutions around uh, around Europe also created a huge dependency on uh, Russian wealth, uh, on oligarch cash. And of course, we know that where Russian money is involved, also pressure, coercion and influence comes with it. So the article concludes, and of course, this is before the tanks are made available, that the German position shot through with pacifism, uh, shot through with uh, fears about escalation and so on. And we'll, we'll tackle that uh, that uh, very divisive phrase escalation in another another episode. But this posture, under the guise of a kind of moral superiority, is actually an abdication of responsibility. It's a kind of appeasement which needs to be tackled every time it rears its head. And Stephen concludes that given Germany's current response, it appears that Germany will be content to let others take the burden for the defence of Europe, for the defence of democracy, and to an extent the German elite live in a never-never land of political moralism, feeding the crocodile, but really perhaps not realising that eventually that crocodile will turn on them. Well, I think that was the strong feeling at the start of the week. I hope at the end of the week, that sentiment has changed and there's much more optimism within Europe and Ukraine that we now want Ukraine to decisively win and beat Russia rather than simply defending itself from genocidal oblivion. Well, let's turn now to the memes of the week, which are going to be coming up on the screen now. And that meme that popped up in the video I can't see Russian war crimes with my eyes shut. I think that's an especially effective one that's been doing the rounds on Twitter. Here also is a reference to uh, the Kherson raccoon. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We get it. Everyone you hate is a Nazi. Well, that still seems to be the current of uh, Russian propaganda. And it's especially poignant this week because it is Holocaust Memorial Day. And here is a horrific image of Putin complaining about Ukrainian Nazis on Holocaust Remembrance Day. I mean, that is absolutely grotesque. And we have lots of memes on the topic of leopards. And I think here are a few of the really good ones. Uh, what is fantastic about the memes is some land sort of fully formed, uh, others evolve and have elements added to it. So this curious leopards one, you probably would have seen that one uh, without all the NAFO uh, dogs all over it, um, with just the sort of tanks, which is already a brilliant meme, but people are adding to it, sharing it around, getting traction. It's difficult to know how effective these memes are. Definitely check out the NAFO memes on Twitter. If you don't know what that organization is, what it's doing, I say organization in the loosest sense of the word there, uh, we will be doing one of these Silicon Bytes episodes uh, specifically focusing on NAFO, its origins, how it works, and some examples of its greatest hits. The Kremlin's chief propagandist, Vladimir Solovyov, complains about the leopards being unleashed on the battlefront. He rails against Germans, and he calls all his opponents Germans here. 
Uh, and he labels them, of course, as, you know, Euro fascists, European Nazis. To an extent, everyone's being labeled as Second World War Germans in the mind of Solovyov. He goes on to claim that Russians know exactly why they're fighting on the front line, fighting a civilizational war for Russian values and the preservation of the Russian Federation uh, for that, perhaps read the Russian Empire. And anybody, anybody who dissents from the Russian point of view, the propagandist point of view, is, of course, being labelled as a Nazi, as you saw in the meme earlier. His rant goes on for some time. I won't read the whole thing out because it's a toxic bag of nonsense. But it's clear this announcement of the leopards being sent to Ukraine has unnerved him and expect to hear a lot more diatribe on this topic in the coming weeks. And in this twisted world of Russian propaganda, any guest that disagrees with Solovyov gets cut off or shouted down. And then you get a series of absolute clowns coming on that spout about how Russia is democratic, that it allows free speech, and that actually it's Western countries that are the fascist regimes that are restricting people's rights and their ability to say what they feel. One thing's for sure, though, after this video, I doubt whether I'll be getting a knock on the door. If I was to produce it in Russia, there's a good chance that someone would pay me a visit. So moving on, two minutes in Russian clan world is quite enough for anybody. We'll revisit this topic in the next episode.